everybody if I didn't get to say hi yet. Hey. Hey. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. It's a beautiful day in here. You'll know that today is it's an exciting morning for me because we start this new sermon series. We're going to be in it for, for quite a while. And we've also really tried to emphasize this as an outreach opportunity uh, for us. And many times when you do something like this, the out, it's all about pushing and trying to get people to that very first service and, and hold them for the whole thing. But really, uh, the way we're doing it is you can, be, you can be thinking in terms of outreach the whole time through this. And even, even that, with these cards that we've got that you can uh, keep on you and hand out, these are actually going to be cards that even after uh, this sermon series is over, we still want to send them to the same page on our website, which then links to whatever it is we're really trying to emphasize uh, at that time. So we've got a couple places. Just a main thing I want to plug with you is up here uh, next to the organ uh, in the back there in the vestibule. Uh, you got a couple options on what you can uh, take with you. These are little a little 10 pack of cards. If you haven't already gotten those, I know a lot of you have already taken some of these. Uh, but a little 10 pack of cards you can take with you. We have some of these left over from last week where you have the sermon series list. If you didn't get that, you can get it with one of these cards attached to it. And then if you are, I already got the Ollie right away. I already ran this over to him. But if you have like a, a business or a counter or somewhere where you know uh, that these could be set, we've got these little uh, business card holders. And so you can set this somewhere and just uh, there's one box left up over here and there's a few, there's like two or three boxes in the back. Uh, you can just get these and just set them wherever and then go by and refill them. If you have a business or some place like that, that that would work, uh, please do uh, do that. We have tonight, uh, we do have two meetings that I hope that you will think about attending, especially if you're on the Women on Mission or you have previously been Women on Mission facilitation team or Men on Mission. So Men on Mission is meeting at 4 o'clock, and Women on Mission is meeting at 5 o'clock, and something that I should have put here in this bulletin, there is a Men on Mission project this coming Saturday. This coming Saturday morning, uh, we're going to be removing this big pile of debris that's up at uh, 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 Stanley Christian Ministries up in Stanfield, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about tonight, in addition to we might uh, bring in some other projects. So please, men in the church, uh, if you can, plan on uh, participating in a mission project next Saturday morning, and we'll try to do some phone trees and some phone calls to, to let you know more about that. But men and women on mission meetings tonight, if you want to be part of that, really love to have you. Think about these cards, how you can get them out, and please leave with some of those today. That's one of my main plugs I want to encourage you in regards uh, to. With that, uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's just open it with a word of prayer, okay? Let's pray. Father God, it's exciting to be in your house this morning. I'm excited to be here, and I pray that every person uh, who's in here is, God. Thank you that you, you got us up, that you got us out, that you're shining that sunlight on us out there, but also that you would shine uh, the light of your, uh, your countenance in this room, in this place uh, here today. Uh, we, we realize, Lord, there's still a lot of people that, that can't gather with us, and we pray, Lord, that you would help through the, through the online uh, sermon that we post later today, you would help them to, to feel bonded with us and feel involved with us. And we also pray that you continue to keep us safe as we gather uh, here in this place, Lord. And uh, we know we can trust you with, with all things and that you're working in mighty and powerful ways in, in our lives. We pray that this would be part of that today, that you're going to mold and shape and guide and bring us along uh, as we study your word and as we worship and as we pray together. You are a great God. For those of us who have made professions of faith, it is great uh, to be your people. And we pray, Lord, if anybody comes in here today and has yet to trust you as their Lord and Savior, you would make today the day of their salvation. We lift up this time to you. We pray that you're glorified in it. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, come on, help me out. Let's all stand and sing, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. And this is the same tune as the doxology. Let's all stand and sing. <laughs>
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the One of the things right there you get in our in our sermon series, we'll have to talk about one God and three persons. That's one of the things, that's one of the ones that if you go through that list of the sermons, one of the ones that we'll do. Uh, he's both, it's both one God and one and three. And how do you be both one and three? Uh, that's one of the things that's difficult for us to comprehend. That's a lot of what this, uh, it's not either or, it, it's both. That's one of the things that this sermon series uh, is about. We're going to cover a lot of scriptures today when we talk about what it means to be saints, but also, are we sinners? If we're saints, are we sinners? If we're sinners, are we saints? Uh, well, I want to give you a, a scripture reading that's going to be one of the portions that we're going to cover later. I'm just going to read uh, more than I get to read during the message. If you would go to Ephesians, please, chapter 5. Ephesians 5. 
I mean, this would probably be a good opportunity as well. Uh, I know you came in today, it felt like you had a, probably a whole book in your, uh, in your bulletin, right? And uh, if you didn't, that means you probably left a trail behind you of things you dropped out of your bulletin. Uh, we, we do begin our, uh, our Annie Armstrong offering uh, today. We're going to collect it throughout the month. And then I believe that Easter is the first Sunday in April this year. And so that, this is really our Easter offering. That's what this is. So you get to get your, now you have your envelope for it. Uh, you also have uh, for this pamphlet that you can read up about it. It probably can send you to some online resources as well. And then, you know, throughout the month then, we're, we didn't do it this week. We're going to start it next week. We're going to show you videos and various things to remind us about uh, what Annie Armstrong offering accomplishes every year. It's the most, one of the most important offerings that we do in a calendar year, especially as Southern Baptists, as it goes to support North American missions. And that, that most specifically includes church plants uh, in North America. Now you've had time to get there to Ephesians chapter 5. I ask you to follow along with me. It says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetedness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God remains forever. Amen. Let's all stand and sing. Okay, this song is to the tune of the Church of One Foundation, the first hymn.
Y'all going to stay and sing over there too? I appreciate that. I will do it early so you don't have to hear me preach twice. But, <laughs> but now, that, now that Daniel and, and Lauren are in here, and uh, I think he said we, I think, are Mandy and, Mandy and them at volleyball still, right? And uh, let's see, Leslie's probably at volleyball. And so I'm thinking I might just keep you for the sermon because I don't know who else I'm going to preach to. But, uh, uh, but no, I'm sure there'll be a few people over there. God will make it well worth our while. I'm excited about this sermon series in one respect because it is, it's a doctrinal sermon series, and I like preaching doctrine, and of course all of it has life application. When we say, you, you notice that the title, on the title, uh, it's Deeper Faith, and one of the things that we originally called it was, you know, Deeper Doctrine. But then part of feeling there was that doctrine's a scary word for people. But really, uh, when, as, as your, your doctrine becomes deeper, your faith becomes deeper. Because you understand uh, your relationship with God better. You understand your relationship with other people. You understand who you are before, before the Lord. And as we explore these doctrines, it's these doctrines where we tend to think it's that these things have to be either or because they seem contradictory uh, in nature. But they actually, it's really both in a sense. And this is one of the ones we start off with, Christians as both sinners and saints. Uh, really, I'll probably go more with this. You just classify yourself, if you are a Christian, as a saint. But then as we're going to explore, it's as a saint who still can sin. And uh, so some of them will lean a little bit more towards others in how, how I teach them. But some of the others that we'll cover, uh, God as both loving and wrathful, believers as both chosen and choosing, Jesus as both priest and sacrifice, Jesus as both man and God, salvation as both now and not yet, people as both living and dying, God as both judge and justifier, Jesus as both creator and creature, People as both spirit and flesh, salvation as both grace and works, believers as both last and first, and God as both, that's the last one right there. Might have to have you back to sing a song again. It'll be three months from now, so, you know, it'll be brand new. Uh, it'll be God as both one and three. And so I do want to remind you the other thing is even give these cards out, even if you can't, if the person's not going to come to church, whether, whether due to COVID concerns or because they don't live around here or they go to another church, they can always get these uh, online now, of course. So we might be able to increase our, uh, our ministry footprint, as it were, by people you know, receiving these messages uh, online. But here we talk about Christians as sinners and saints. As Christians, we are both sinners and saints. And you're kind of going to get this, maybe I'll say this more up front. In a sense, it's more that our... Our condition is as saints, but we still can sin. And how you kind of rectify that is what we're talking about today. Most definitions would have those things being contradictory or mutually exclusive. How can you be a saint if you sin? And how can you be a, a sinner and be a saint? This just doesn't work. Um, if we were to say, for instance, this might be one I've heard many times, my grandma was a saint, all right? Because all grandmas are saints, right? Crickets on that one. Nobody knew what to say. If my grandma was a saint, what does that mean when we're saying that? I think what that means is that my grandma was not characterized by bad or evil or sin. To understand the doctrinal concept of being both sinner and saint, it's really the, doctrinal, doctrinal, the doctrine of sainthood. We must start with identifying our base condition. So we'll start with our condition. First of all is this. Number one, we're all born sinners. We're all born sinners. Everybody is born a sinner. Our base condition of every human being, we're all born sinners. Very famous verse is Romans 3.23. We added the end of verse 22. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
That's our condition from the get-go. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This has to do with the doctrine of original sin. And here's the description in Romans chapter 5 of original sin, but it's also then bringing in the grace of, Jesus, the grace of God through Jesus Christ. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Go ahead and give them the next verse. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. One man is Adam. He is the man of disobedience. And many were made sinners. Original sin passed down to then all Adam's descendants. Then the other man, the man of obedience, is Jesus Christ. And by him, many will be made righteous. Not all will be made righteous because not all will come to him in faith. All were made, when you get many were made sinners right here, that's really a reference to all were made sinners. All could be made righteous if they would come to him in faith, but not all will. But if we come to him in faith, then we are made righteous. So you get the doctrine of original sin. We all start out sinners unless God does something. Unless God does something, which he did in Christ, a sinner is our final condition. Not, 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 not only our beginning condition, but our final condition will be as a sinner unless God does something, which he has done in Jesus Christ. A significant aspect of understanding our change in condition upon coming to faith in Jesus Christ is this. Number two, we become saints through Christ. We become saints through Christ. How many of you ever thought of yourself as a saint? Not a lot, huh? Saint Becky. See, she, she, she feels uncomfortable, right? Right? Now, you, now everybody's wondering, is he going to pick on me? St. Jacob. There you go. Wake him up. Tell him I said St. Jacob. <laughs> He's ignoring me. <laughs> you can go around the room, right? And every, every time people would be like, eh, like this. But the reality is we become saints through Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, you're a saint. Ah, wait a minute. I'm no saint. You don't know my heart. You know what I, what I, not only what I've done, but what I still unfortunately do. A major aspect of misunderstanding all Christians as saints has to do with the Catholic Church's practice of recognizing exceptional Christians as such. But we must realize, as Scripture tells us, here's Ephesians chapter 2. For through him, that is Jesus Christ, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. All that comes in there that makes that transformation is faith in Jesus Christ. Having access then by the Holy Spirit to the Father through faith in Jesus Christ, you're therefore no longer a stranger, you're no longer an outsider, you're no longer a foreigner, but you're a fellow citizen with the saints and members of the household of God. I will tell you that, and I know uh, a lot of you uh, like to carry NIV Bible, it's a good translation, but I think it does a terrible job here. You know why? It takes out saints right there. Anybody got an NIV on you? And be like, oh, don't pick on me. I'm going to get it wrong. Who's carrying? Anybody got an NIV? No? What's it say? Can you go ahead? Go ahead. Well, you're probably not already on that verse, are you? All right. Yeah, that's a good point. Sorry. I'm throwing them up on the screen for you. Uh, what it does is, and, and I should have put it down myself and read it for you, uh, but what it does, it leaves saints out there. I believe the way it says, but you are just a fellow, just fellow citizens and members of God's household. I think it just goes, it says it like that. But what it does is it leaves out a very important word. Actually, the Greek word there is, the, the best pronunciation would be like agion. All right, agion. And that word right there has to do with the idea of being the separate, sanctified, holy people. Not just the people, but a separate, sanctified, holy people. In fact, that word saint actually comes from the Latin word sanctus. And sanctus has, is also where we end up getting the word sanctified, okay? Or sanctity. 
So all those concepts are there in that Greek word, and what they have to do with is, we, and that's where we get our word, saint. I'm going to talk more about that word saintness at the end of this message, but for now it's enough to recognize that a fundamental change had to take place within the person, which Scripture describes then as believers becoming part of a group. And that group is called saints. You are the saints. There's other names. We're, we're also the church. We're also the people of God. We're the household of God. But I give you this name today, this concept of saints, because we need to understand this fundamental change that takes place within us, that qualifies us differently, that we are not just as we were before as a sinner. And I tell you this today, if you come in here today and who you are is a sinner, through Jesus Christ, you can become a saint but we're all going to tell you it's not going to mean you still don't struggle with sin. But it does mean you have fundamentally changed in what your condition is. In many respects, all that we talk about here is a misunderstanding of what it means to be a saint. It all derives from the conflict which consistently emerges in the Christian life. And I want to talk a little bit about this conflict right here. The conflict is twofold. One, as saints, we still battle sin. We still battle against sin. As Christians, we're more prone to describe ourselves as sinners than saints. But we actually do a real disservice to the Lord when we do that. Because if you are born a sinner... And then you get saved, and you receive the Lord, and you're still a sinner, then what changed? Then nothing changed. Well, something changed. You went from being a sinner to a saint, but the conflict within us, the conflict is that as saints we still sin. How can I be a saint when I still sin? The Bible even describes sin as not characteristic of saints, and this is from, from part of that scripture reading that we had earlier. I give you verses three and four as part of it. But fornication and all uncleanness or uncovetedness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. It tells you right here a, a pretty broad list. In a sense, it's both broad and narrow. It's very specific, and then at the same time, one will say fornication or covetedness, but then it'll also say all uncleanness. Boy, that's pretty broad. I think some of my behaviors, some of my thoughts, some of the things I do and some things I don't do can probably fall under the category of some degree of uncleanness, unrighteousness, neither filthiness or foolish talking. Even the book of, book of James talks about if man could control his tongue, he'd control the whole world. How many of us have been guilty of coarse jesting, which are not fitting? Not fitting for who? Not fitting, it says, for saints, but rather giving thanks. And then after that, you saw there was a list earlier given of some of the attributes that are contrary uh, to this. This text is describing a person who would not be participating in behavior typical of a saint. Yet, we could all look at this and say, well, but it's both describing me a little bit. The text is actually describing a person who aspires to engage in such sin. Not a person who in Christ is battling against such behavior. As a sinner, really, the desires of our heart is to engage in such sin only to the degree to which we might get caught or the degree to which it might cause us a pain and suffering or struggle, might we say, I don't want to do that. But our, as a sinner, our heart's desire then is then to sin. But then in Christ, our heart's desire becomes different. Our heart's desire says, you know what, that, that, that behavior is not fitting of a saint. And I am called to something different, yet that sin still battles against our soul. We have to realize, though, this, when we're talking about this battle, this is a lot more than trying to be a good person. 
You can try to be a good person without Christ. You don't need Christ to try to be a good person. People do that all the time. But with Christ, you receive a power to be the right kind of person. What kind of person? A Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, somebody who's Christ-like, as is fitting for a saint. A result of our fundamental chain, fundamental condition changes in sainthood because in receiving Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. So that, number two, we said as saints, we still battle sin. And by the way, there's a typo on your card. I think I fixed it on the PowerPoint. Uh, as saints, we're able to battle sin. I think it said, no, I didn't fix it on the PowerPoint, did I? We saints, we're able to battle sin. Obviously, that's a typo right there. So that we at the beginning should be as saints, we're able to battle sin. As saints, we still battle sin. The sinner may battle against sin, but they don't have something given to them which empowers them to overcome sin. As Christians, we have something given to us that gives us the power, the ability, where we're able to battle sin in a way that we were not able before. The saint's life is characteristic of and reflective of having this power. Does anybody know where this power comes from? You want to throw out a guess on that one? Well, you got the Father, you got the Son, and then you got who? Holy Spirit. Now, we're not going to do a hand raise. How many of you... Not going to do a hand raise. How many of you knew that? Wish you'd said it. It's the Holy Spirit. And that's really where you end up going with this thing. Remember that word sanctus had to do with sanctification. And that's really where we have to start, start working our way towards as we understand the doctrine of sainthood. The word able, by the way, there. And you'll notice how various doctrines cross paths. You'll probably hear the doctrine of this and the doctrine of this and the doctrine of this a lot over the next uh, several weeks. Throughout the spring. That key word in that sentence, as saints were able to battle sin. The key word there is able. We have the ability. We're able to battle sin as we are not able to do as our natural selves. This relates to the doctrine, by the way, of total depravity. That we, without God, without Jesus Christ, without the Holy Spirit, are totally depraved. Great verse for understanding this is Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. There is none righteous. By the way, it has quotes around these things because this is Paul quoting the Old Testament to help make his point. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. But you might look and you might say, well, the Bible tells me that I've been made righteous. Right? Didn't we have a verse earlier that said that? We had a verse earlier that said that exact same thing. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Oh, so there's something that can make me righteous. We might look here and we might say, well, there's none who seeks after God. Actually, I came here today to, to seek after God. There's something within me that draws me to want to want to know the Lord better, be around other believers. They have all turned aside. They become unprofitable. There's none who does good. I know that God has been working in my life to accomplish good things. But what you understand here is that this is talking about the person before Christ. This is your B.C. days right here. This is a person that is before conversion. That within the person who has yet to receive the Holy Spirit, yes to trust in Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior, there's none, there's none of them are righteous, not even one. They don't understand. They don't seek after God. They've turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. You might say, well, I, I know that lost people can do good things, but they can't do good things unto the Lord. They can't willingly serve the Lord. They, will, they can't willingly accomplish His eternal work. And they can't do so under the perfect power of the Holy Spirit. A fundamental change takes place. It's talking about how in our own power, 
what will happen ultimately is sin will always win out. But as saints, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we can battle sin in a way that we could never do on our own. For this, I want to lead you to Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. In verse 12, you get a reference to eternal inheritance. Inheritance qualified as saints. The inheritance of the saints in the light. In order to receive the inheritance of the saints, you got to be a what? I mean, it's the inheritance of the saints, so you got to be a what to get it? You got to be a saint in order to get it. And I guarantee you want it, because this is the eternal inheritance which has been set aside by God for His people since the beginning. This is eternity that we look forward to. This is heaven, y'all. All right? This is existence eternally with God and His eternal riches. Yeah, you want it. So you want to be a saint from an eternal perspective. But you don't wait to be a saint. You become a saint now. It's an eternal inheritance qualified as saints. Giving thanks to Father who has qualified us. He has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He's qualified us. By the way, this is a doctrine of justification. We've been justified. We've been qualified before God. Verse 14 then talks about how this is by forgiveness of sins through Christ's blood, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. That when, when, I, when I get washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, He forgives me from every sin I ever committed, but He also forgives me from what? Every sin I'm ever going to commit. It's hard to understand how He could do such a thing, but He does. And that's why we then have that eternal inheritance But likewise, you look in verse 13 and you see that we've also been delivered from the power of darkness. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. It speaks in a past tense there when it talks about it. It talks about something in the future, but it uses the past tense. We've already been conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Because we've already been delivered from the power of darkness. So we've already been delivered in Christ Jesus from the power daily of sin. It doesn't have to have control of us because we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to battle against that sin every day. That is a quality of being a saint. To be empowered in such a way as to overcome sin that did not come naturally to me as a sinner but becomes part of me as a saint. One of the sayings I have, and I think I already may may mention this, I want to save it till later, but it had to come out at the beginning, was this. In a real sense, we're saints that still sin. We're not sinners if you're in Christ Jesus. Do God more credit than that, right? If you still say, I'm just a sinner, then he didn't do anything. Give him credit for it. He fundamentally changed you. You are a saint, but you recognize, I'm a saint that still sins, unfortunately. So how then do I even rectify that? I still need to work to a conclusion in this regard. So we had our our condition, we had our conflict. We still need to be brought around to a conclusion, though. That still needs to be nailed down for us. While in Ephesians we saw the doctrine of past and present justification, we see here then the doctrine of future assured glorification, both of which allude to the Christian life experience and the doctrine then of sanctification. I'll put it this way for you. If you're a Christian, you have been justified. You will be glorified. So what's going on right now? You are being sanctified. Sanctified. Sanctus. 
The word where we get what? In Latin, the word saint. I, I have been justified. I will be glorified. An assured glorification. An assured hope. I am being sanctified. In Ephesians, we saw the doctrine of justification. And as we moved up to Romans and Colossians, we saw the doctrine of future glorification. Both of those had the allusion, though, to this present Christian life experience and the doctrine of sanctification. So then we understand in Christ, we have a change in our condition which creates in us a conflict that in turn leads to a conclusion. And our conclusion is this. And as you think in terms of yourself as a saint, but a saint who battles sin. Maybe that's even better than a saint who still sins, huh? Maybe that's better. I am a saint who battles sin. Now, why didn't I think of that before? Must be one of those moments when the preacher works on the ho- uh, when the when the Holy Spirit works on the preacher right at the moment, right? I'm a saint who battles sin. I was a sinner. Now I'm a saint who battles daily against sin. And that process is sanctification. But before we get completely sanctification, we have to understand one conclusion here. Both of these conclusions result from the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The first conclusion is this. Number one, sainthood means I'm sealed by the Spirit. Sainthood means I'm sealed by the Spirit. You actually can't even sin your way into being a sinner again. What? (laughs) Jennifer just made it look like, what did you just say? I don't understand what you just did. Yeah, I can can sin. The quality of what I am has been sealed. And it's been sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's nothing that I have done. It is what God has done in me. Sainthood means sealed by the Spirit. Even though I still battle sin, my status as a saint has been sealed. It has been sealed. And for this, uh, I give you Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, and then we'll read these, and then we'll, we'll jump over to 18 uh, a- after that. But I'll say a couple things about 13 and 14 after I read them. In him, that is in Christ, you also trusted. All right? That's, you trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation after you heard a word of truth. You heard a word, you trusted in the word, it was the gospel of your salvation. That's what you got. When you trusted, you got saved. In whom also, having believed, there, that's faith, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That was done. When? It was when you believed that it was done, right? Having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Not after you believed and then you were a pretty good person or a real good saint. Got your name put up on a wall somewhere in the church. No, you were sealed when you believed by the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. It describes coming to faith, believing then being sealed with the Holy Spirit, being justified, wherein the power of sin to result in death has now been broken. The power of sin to result in death. The wages of sin is what, church? You know this one. It's death. The power of sin to result in death has been broken because I now have, verse 14, a guarantee of that internal inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So it's talking about that future glorification is assured. I've been justified. I'll be glorified. That's all been sealed. It's all been taken care of. I don't have to worry about that. Now, I'd be where I am and what God's got me doing. So we move to verse 18. In the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Once again, talking about this group of people that have an assured inheritance, 
But you notice how when you're in verse 13 and 14, it's all about what has happened and what will happen. And now you come down to verse 18, and it talks about now the eyes of your understanding have been enlightened. You notice how as you grow as a Christian, there were things that earlier in your Christian walk you never even recognized as sin. And now as you continue to grow, you realize, yeah, that's a problem that God wants to work on in my life. That's part of that sanctification process. That's part of that enlightening where he shows us things. Another part of our enlightening is his word. When we go to him in his word and he continues to just, he jumps off the, it jumps off the page to us, the truth and the realities of our lives and how we're living and what we need to do. And we become enlightened people. The light gets turned on in our lives and that light is Jesus Christ, the living word of God. The eyes of our understanding have then been enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What is his calling on my life? What he's called me out to live for, the riches of his glory, all part of being a saint. All part of living in sainthood. It also now is an enlightened understanding of our current condition, which is our final conclusion in what it means to be both sinner and saint, or more accurately, a saint who still battles sin. So our conclusion is, first of all, to realize sainthood means I've been sealed by the Spirit. But it also ultimately means this. Sainthood means being sanctified by the Spirit. It's number two. Sanctified by the Spirit. Maybe our goal here today is to say, whenever I think of what it means to be a saint, I think of being sanctified. I think of a process towards Christ-likeness where there is less sin in my life and there is more righteousness in my life. Remember that Latin word, sanctus. And now we talk about sanctification, which always should be described as, I believe, progressive sanctification. A verse that succinctly links sainthood and sanctification, I believe, is 1 Corinthians 1-2. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. You see the link there? Those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus are also those who are called to be saints. And then it makes sure we understand there that this is something that all believers enjoy. It says, to all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ. Does that sound like it's describing really elite Christians? No, it says all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ are the ones who have been called to be saints and who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Not really elite Christians are saints. If you're a believer, you've been called to be a saint. And in that, you are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Progressive sanctification is a process. If you want, you're like, I still don't understand what this sanctification is. Well, maybe I can give it to you now. It's a process by which the Spirit produces in believers a progressive increase in Christ-likeness. It is a lifelong process. The extent of the progress varies. It varies at times in our lives. It varies the person that we are. The extent to which we're seeking the Lord. The extent of our own obedience. But as part of our sainthood, it should always be increasing. Since sanctification forms the crux of the believer's present life, it is vitally important to understand it and to embrace it. To be a saint is to be sealed by the Spirit and empowered by the Spirit with the ability to then overcome sin in progressive sanctification. I said before, if I could have you leave here today and think immediately, being a saint means I am being sanctified, then we would accomplish our goal. In the middle of that is the fact that sin still exists. But I have still been fundamentally changed in who I am and empowered to overcome that sin. To be a saint is to be sealed with the Spirit 
empowered by the Spirit with the ability to overcome sin and progressive sanctification. The last verse I want to share with you this morning is this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the second half of verse 13. God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Maybe this verse will come back up when we have uh, the one that says both, you both choose and are chosen. All right? You can crack your brain on that one here in a few weeks. But you notice this. It has been God's work in you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. If you're a believer, you're in a process of sanctification. It is what all saints enjoy. It is empowered through the Holy Spirit. It's sanctification by the Holy Spirit. It is part of our salvation experience. That we are experiencing our salvation today as sanctification. The day you got saved, you experienced your salvation as justification. And one day you will experience your salvation in glorification. But here is our time of sanctus. Our time of sainthood in which we have not yet received our full inheritance, but we are being sanctified. Our conclusion here is to know that sainthood is supposed to be a process of ongoing progressive sanctification. Wherein we always wage the battle with sin. And that means we have to come out every day in the power of the Holy Spirit ready to wage war against sin. And not just sin out here, but sin in here, as is fitting of the saints. Thus, in a sense, we are both sinner and saint, or maybe we would say more accurately, we are saints that still battle sin. If you came in here today... And you know you're a sinner. You've never come to faith. You had yet to come to faith in Jesus Christ. You had yet to have this transformational experience. We invite you today to step from sinner to saint. By believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That he died on the cross. And that he rose again from the grave. And if you will trust in his death as payment for your sins. That his blood was enough to pay for your sins. That is what we all believe. And that his resurrection secures your resurrection in eternity. You will become a new person empowered by the Holy Spirit. We would invite you to come forward today as we, as we sing in close. But we also know this. Whenever we stand and sing as a church at the end of our church services, God's doing something in every single one of us because he said something to every single one of our hearts. Maybe there's an area of sin in your life that you, all, you have recognized this whole message as saying it is not fitting of a saint. And that is something that you right now need to deal with as we go to God in song. So as our musicians come forward, and as we sing and we enjoy that special power that is when the people of God sing together, I encourage you to be also communicating with God, even as we communicate with one another. And if you have any reason to come down today, I'm going to be down here. I'm going to be ready to receive you. And I ask you to come forward. Will you please stand? Let's close in song. Thank you.